Hello, Dan here from howtomechatronics.com. In this video, we will learn what is train wave gear, also known as harmonic drive. First, we will explain its working principle, then design our own model and 3D print it so we can see it in real life and better understand how it works. A strain wave gear is a unique type of mechanical gearing system which allows very high reduction ratios in a compact and lightweight package. Compared to traditional gearing systems such as helical gears or planetary gears, it can achieve much higher reduction ratios of up to 30 times in the same space. In addition to that, it has zero backlash characteristic, high torque, accuracy and reliability. Therefore, this gearing system is used in many applications, including robotics, aerospace, medical machines, milling machines, manufacturing equipment and so on. The strain wave gear was invented in 1957 by C. Walton Musser, and the other name which is commonly used for it, Harmonic Drive, is actually a brand name of a strain wave gear trademarked by the Harmonic Drive company. Ok, so let's take a look how it works now. A harmonic drive has three key components, a wave generator, a flex spline and a circular spline. The wave generator has an elliptical shape and consists of an elliptical hub and a special thin walled bearing which follows the elliptical shape of the hub. This is the input of the gear set and it's connected to the motor shaft. As the wave generator rotates, it generates a wave motion. The flex spline has a form of cylindrical cup and it's made out of flexible but torsionally stiff alloy steel material. The sides of the cup are very thin but the bottom is thick and rigid. This allows the open end of the cup to be flexible but the closed end to be quite rigid and therefore we can use it as an output and connect the output flange to it. The flex spline has external teeth on the open end of the cup. On the other hand, the circular spline is a rigid ring with teeth on the inside. The circular spline has two more teeth than the flex spline, which is actually the key design of the strain wave gear system. So when we insert the wave generator into the flex spline, the flex spline takes the shape of the wave generator. As the wave generator rotates, it radially deforms the open end of the flex spline. The wave generator and the flex spline are then placed inside the circular spline, meshing the teeth together. Because of the elliptical shape of the flex spline, the teeth mesh only in two regions on the opposite sides of the flex spline, and that's across the major axis of the wave generator ellipse. Now as the wave generator rotates, the flex spline teeth that are meshed with those of the circular spline will slowly change position. Because of the tooth count difference between the flex spline and the circular spline, for each 180 degrees rotation of the wave generator, the teeth meshing will cause the flex spline to rotate a small amount backward relative to the wave generator. In other words, with each 180 degrees rotation of the wave generator, the flex spline teeth mesh with the circular spline will advance by only one tooth. So, for a full rotation of 360 degrees of the wave generator, the flex spline will change position or advance by two teeth. We can easily calculate the reduction ratio with the following formula. The ratio is equal to the flex spline teeth minus the circular spline teeth divided by the flex spline teeth. So, with the example of 200 teeth on the flex spline and 202 teeth on the circular spline, the reduction ratio is minus 0.01. That's 1 100 the speed of the wave generator and the minus sign indicates that the output is in the opposite direction. We can get different reduction ratios by changing the number of teeth. We can achieve that by either changing the mechanism diameter while having the same size teeth or by changing the teeth size while preserving the size and weight of the gear set. Ok, so now as we know the theory behind the strain wave gear, let me show you how I designed one so we can build it with just using a 3D printer. But before we do that, I would like to give a shout out to JLCPCB for sponsoring this video. JLCPCB is a manufacturer of high quality PCBs, which are used in many industries for prototyping as well as DIY projects. Once you have your PCB design ready, simply upload the Gerber file, 
review your PCB in the Gerber viewer, select the properties that you want and order your PCB at a reasonable price. If it's your first order from JLC PCB, you can get up to 5 PCBs for only $2. Ok, so I designed this model of a string wave gear using Fusion 360. All of these parts can be 3D printed, so we just need some bolts and nuts and some bearings to complete the assembly. As for the input, I chose to use a NEMA 17 stepper motor. Here's how I designed the three key elements of the string wave gear, the circular spline, the flex spline and the wave generator. As 3D printers have their own limitations how good, accurate and precise can print, the first thing that I had to decide was the module of the gears, or how big or small the teeth will be. I chose a module of 1.25 and 72 teeth for the circular spline. Of course, the flex spline needs to have 2 teeth less, or that's 70 teeth. That will result in 35 to 1 reduction ratio while having a relatively small size of the gear set. As for the wave generator, we cannot really use those special type of thin wall bearings mentioned earlier as they are not easy to find. Instead, we will use a normal ball bearings arranged around a circumference of an ellipse. The dimensions of the ellipse should be made according to the dimensions of the inner wall of the flex plane. I made the major excess radius of the ellipse to be 1.25 mm bigger than the radius of the inner wall of the flex plane. On the other hand, the minor axis radius of the ellipse is 1.25 mm smaller. The wave generator will be made out of two sections on which the 10 bearings can be easily attached. One of these sections will also feature a shaft coupler suitable for securing the NEMA 17 stepper motor. The rest of the parts are designed around these three key elements. On the output side of the housing, we will insert two bearings with 47mm outer diameter and we will secure them with the help of some bolts and nuts. The output flange is made out of two parts connected with bolts and nuts so we can easily secure it to the two bearings. Ok, it's time to 3D print the parts now. You can find and download the 3D model as well as the STL files which are used for 3D printing on the website article. The link is in the description of the video. When 3D printing the gears, it's important to use the horizontal expansion feature in your slicing software. I set mine to minus 0.15mm and got relatively decent accuracy on the prints. Note that this might vary from printer to printer. If we don't use this feature, the prints will be slightly bigger due to the expansion of the filament when printing and the parts or the gears won't be able to mesh properly. I used my Creality CR10 3D printer for printing all of the parts and I think it did a good job considering its price point. If you are interested, there is also a link to this 3D printer in the description. So here are all of the 3D printed parts, as well as the bolts the nuts and the bearings for assembling the harmonic drive. You can find the complete list of all these parts on the website article. I started the assembly by inserting the two output bearings into the housing. The bearings have 47mm outer diameter and 35mm inner diameter. Like I said, I used minus 0.15mm horizontal expansion compensation when slicing the parts so the bearings fitted quite tightly in the housing. In between the two bearings I placed 1.5mm 3D printed distance rings. For securing the bearings to the housing we need 6 M4 countersunk bolts with 25mm length. Here we will also use M4 washers which will touch just enough the outer ring of the bearing and so they will keep the bearing secure to the housing. Next is the flex spline. The walls of the cups are just 1.2mm thick, so although it's printed in PLA material, it's still flexible at the open end. On the closed end of the flex spline, we can attach the output flange using 6 M4 bolts. Once secured, the flex spline is now a bit less flexible than previously, but the closed end is now quite rigid. Next, we need to insert the flex spline through the bearing. 
the output flange goes halfway through the first bearing. On the other side, we will insert the other part of the output flange, which will fit exactly between the two bearings. I continued with placing four M4 nuts in the slots on the output shaft. These nuts will serve for attaching or connecting things to the output of the gear set. To finish the output shaft, on top of this I placed another part which will cover the nuts and using 4 M4 bolts with 40mm length I can finally secure the two output parts together. Now the flex plane and the output shaft can freely move while being secured to the housing. Ok, so next we have the circular spline which will be secured to the housing together with the gear set lid and the motor mount. But before we do that we need to assemble the wave generator. Here first we need to insert two M3 nuts. These nuts will serve for securing the wave generator to the motor shaft using two grab screws. Next we can start inserting the 10 bearings in place. We can notice here how the bearings are distant from the wall just a little bit with the small ledge at the bottom of the shafts. The other part of the wave generator also has such edges so the bearings won't touch the wall. We are going to secure the bearings and actually the whole wave generator with 16mm long M3 bolts and some nuts. Next we need to secure the wave generator to the motor. But before we do that we need to attach the motor to the motor mount and the lid of the gear set. The wave generator should be 2mm apart from the motor lid, so I use two washers as guides when inserting the wave generator in place. Then we just have to tighten the grab screws which are positioned in a way that they can be reached in between the bearings. Finally, we can insert the wave generator into the flex plane and connect everything together. To be honest, it can be a bit difficult to make this fit because we don't have control over the flex plane because of the motor mount. What's left now is to insert M4 nuts in these housing sockets and secure both the circular spline and the wave generator to the housing. And that's it, our strain wave gear or harmonic drive is now done. But as I finished I thought that completing the gear set like this is kind of boring because we can see nothing except a slow rotating output shaft. Therefore I decided to replace the 3D printed gear set lid with an acrylic one so we can also see what's going on inside. I had a 4mm thick acrylic plate so I marked the shape of the lid on it and using a hand saw I roughly cut the shape. Then using a rasp I fine tuned the shape of the acrylic. I made the securing holes with a 3mm drill bit and the big hole for the motor with a 25mm Forstner bit. The shape came out decent at the end. I reassembled the motor and the wave generator back as shown earlier. We can note here that I added some nuts between the acrylic and the housing in order to get the proper distance as the lid had previously. Now this gear set looks much cooler. I connected the stepper motor to an Arduino so I can control the motor speed and direction to better examine and see how the system works. You can find more details about this and the Arduino code on the website article. So here it is. Now we can see how the harmonic drive works in real life. In this case the output shaft is 35 times slower than the input shaft. Here I marked one tooth of the flex plane with red color so we can better track and get sense of the movement of the flex plane. To be honest it's quite fun looking how this thing works. However we can notice that the flex plane sometimes jitters or the motion is not that smooth. There are several reasons for that. In this particular configuration, the problem is that I made the acrylic motor mount by hand, so the motor is not mounted perfectly in the center. When using the original 3D printed motor mount, the movement is much smoother. We can also notice that our harmonic drive is far from having zero backlash. That's because of, like I said earlier, the limitation of this type of 3D printers and how good they can print. It's not just about how good the profile of the tooth can be printed, but also how accurate the overall dimensions are. For example, here I used an insulating tape on the inside of the flex plane 
which is only 0.18 mm thick and with it I got better results. So I guess it's all about testing and tweaking the prints to get better results. I also tried to print the gears with a module of 1.75, but I didn't get any good results. Actually, when using the original 3D printed lid, the motion was smoother but still not good enough. Maybe the problem here was the horizontal expansion feature in the slicing software, and I should tweak that value as well. Nevertheless, I also tried lifting some weights. At a distance of 25 cm, it was able to lift 1.25 kg. That's a torque of around 3 newton meters, which is at least 10 times greater of what this NEMA 17 stepper motor is rated. I guess that's not bad at all. So that's pretty much everything for this video. I would just add that this gearing system can be easily designed to have a hollow shaft, which is very handy for robotics applications. So I might use this type of gearing system or harmonic drive in some of my future videos when making some robotic projects. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe and for more tutorials and projects visit howtomakeatronics.com.